Thinking Basketball Podcast. My name is Ben. Welcome back to another episode. And today we have a very special guest, the one and only, maybe the brain I've been dying to pick the most after going through NBA history for so many years. He is, um, I mean, how many descriptors can we come up with other than legendary coach Mike D'Antoni? Mike, thanks so much for joining. I'm glad to be here. and Thanks for having me. Um, so I have about a million questions I want to I want to get to I've you got about two answers. So we'll talk about <laughs> just go back and forth between those two answers. Uh, so there you go. Uh, so one thing I've noticed studying league history is I have this rule in my head of like 10 three point shots. Is it possible to get a new team to take more than 10 three point shots a game? Um, let me let me say why I, I've sort of seen this rule. When the league jumped lines in 1994 to 1995, when the NBA shortened the line, the biggest team jump was like nine extra threes a game. If you look at your history as a coach, going to different places and using the three-point shot, and I want to talk a little bit about where that comes from and sort of like the history of your philosophy of using the three, but you never really see more than teams ever increase by 10 threes a game. In Denver, you go from 21st at 11 threes a game to second at 18. So you add about seven. In Phoenix, 2004, you're actually there for uh, part of the season in 2004. You didn't get to coach the whole season. 2005, you jump 10 threes a game. With the Knicks, you jump, you want to guess, 10 threes a game. All right. Yeah, yeah. So, like, when when you go into a new situation as a coach, do you, I mean, A, did you even realize that? Did you know sort of the history of those numbers? And B, what do you think is actually happening that it doesn't seem possible to take an NBA team and overnight get them to shoot a ton of threes? And of course, that's relevant now because everyone asks, like, you know, why did it take so long for teams to, sh- to shoot more threes? Why did it take so long for the league to adopt this strategy? Well, I think the biggest thing is just being comfortable with something that Man, that's a pretty big jump, and you're changing the way you play. Uh, for what that's about 90 possessions in a game, or whatever, it's almost 10 percent of your shots are you are different. And for coaches that are either on a short contract or either you know not feeling like they have any kind of support or the type of players they have, um, kind of goes into that thinking on wow, are we shooting too many? Is it getting out of whack? And you become a little bit more conservative then. As you get older, you feel more comfortable. It works. You have an organization that backs you. You have players that do it. Then it kind of fits in. And I'm sure, I'm not for sure what the thing is in Houston, but surely we made some jumps there because, you know, we were trying to get up to about 60 or 70. Houston Houston might be the most amazing one because – Houston was already playing with some space and with, and of course right. with, with Daryl Morey there with embracing this shot, they were second in the league the year before you got there at 31 per game. And mm. I mean, you just can't make this stuff up. You guys jumped to first and you took about 10 more threes per game, oh, four, really? okay. 40 per game the year you got there. Yeah. Right. No, it's just, uh, that's, I think that's a coincidence. I don't know. I've not <laughs> like to look at it. Uh, but you know, uh, Houston was a, was a that's when all the analytic and the organization, the players is like, yeah, we want to do that. So now it's like pushing the gas pedal all the way down the floor and just see where at a certain point is not beneficial to take all these threes. Um, I don't know if we ever found that point, but uh, you know, it's interesting how it just evolves as a coach. You just evolve also. It just takes some, sometimes it takes some guts. You know, you just gotta. Oh, heck! If they fire me, they fire me. We go here. We go. So, where did this sort of embracement, uh, embracing of the three-point line, come from for you? I mean, was it? We were talking right before we recorded. You, a lot of people don't realize you played in the ABA. They had a three-point shot. Yeah. Was it playing in Italy where they had a three-point shot? Like, sort of help me understand in in your mind where the sort of understanding of like, hey, maybe we should use this shot more. Where did that come from in your in your coaching sort of development? I think the biggest thing was um, 
not specifically the three-point shot. I, I like it, whatever. It's how can I open the floor up and try to get layups? Because that was that's the goal, get either fouled or layup. How do you do that? You know, we used to, I used to go to games or summer leagues with my brother who was with me in Phoenix and now is a coach at Marshall University. And we would sit underneath the basket on the baseline and watch, watch how congested the three point area is, how many people are in there and how hard it is to get to the basket. If you watch college basketball, my God, for years, I thought the object of the game was if you can get 10 point to 10 people inside the three second lane and whoever can score gets the win. And it's like, how can you get them out? And so you just evolve into three point shooting, which even then, you know, analytically, I mean, not, most people understand three is better than a two, but, you know, we still wanted to drive the basket, but still do still want to get to the basket. And that's, the only way to do it is put that thread out there. It just evolved into that. And, and then uh, analytics came on the scene uh, probably after the Phoenix things have more heavily. And then when Houston, it was a full blown, you know, shootout. So I've heard you mention this repeatedly, this, this, how space and really opening the floor, creating um, not just driving lanes and scoring opportunities, but passing lanes and just yeah. sort of opening it up is such a big deal I mean, was this something that was in your head when you were a player? Um, let me let me throw another number at you to to help with that. I was able to dig up some Italian league stats from the nineteen oh, eighties. You might be working way too hard. Man. <laughs> this, no, this is how the show works, Mike. This okay, is, right, this, is this is what we do. Um, you guys were taking a ton of threes in Italy, and I don't know as a player if you felt that that created a more open floor. For those who don't know, the line was shorter at yeah. that point in time. It was like a 20 or 21 foot line or something yeah. like that. A little, uh, bit like, a little bit more than college. I exactly. Think. Yeah. yeah. But, but what blew me away about this is if you look at someone like Oscar Schmidt, who was leading the league <laughs> in threes right. at this point, right? right? Like he was taking, I think in 1988, he took nine threes a game and well, the, and the number 10 guy in the league took six threes a game. So for perspective, no one really took more than nine threes a game until Steph Curry in 2016. And right. it probably takes until like the 2006, let's say the mid 2000s before like your number 10 guy in the league is taking six threes a game. So you were way ahead in Italy in this exposure to this. Did that, did that play into your mind when you're playing as a player back then? Did you feel that? And that carries kind of through once you switch to coaching? Because I think you, you went for, to, from, from the court to the bench immediately, right? Yeah. 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 I, for sure it did, whether it was subconsciously or whether I thought this is the way to go. That's the way we played. And, uh, you know, it really started in college. I went to Marshall University, and we had a, a weird kind of mixture of players. Our center was like 6'5", athletic, not a three-point shooter per se. We didn't even, I don't, I don't even think we had three-point shooting back then. I'm pretty sure we didn't. Uh, but um, he was a 6'5 guy that could put the ball on the floor and get to the basket, all that. Then our four player shot way out and he was 6'11". So it's kind of a, everybody else were, we spread the floor and we ran like crazy and we overachieved. And so then you go to, uh, in the ABA, same thing more or less, you overachieve a little bit. And then you go to Italy and definitely in Italy, especially when I started coaching, I just felt like in practice, the way I played the game, the way it was, it's just better to get these guys out. Now, I didn't have the stats where if you throw the ball into the post, you're scoring like 0.8 per possession, at a, and that's a good post-up player. And, you know, pick and rolls were like 1.20 or 1.10. So that made sense when you put analytic stuff into it. But um, I just you just had I had a feel. That's the way it should be. It should be opened up. The faster you can play, the better. Defenses don't set up. So it all came together – as a philosophy. And then, you know, the final touch is you got to have the players that can do it. Right. You got to tweak that to who you have. I mean, it's nice to say, yeah, give me this, give me that. Then you walk into first practice. Well, this is what you got. And you better, whatever it takes to win, whatever it takes to not win, but whatever it takes to be efficient offensively. That's what you have to do, whether it's a lot of threes or no one can shoot a three. So you better find, figure out something else to do. 
So, so you told this story on JJ Reddick's podcast about the 1993 team that you had in Milan, where yeah. essentially, I think the way you describe it is you you bench the leading scorer and right. kind of change some things around. I mean, when I heard that, that blew me away, just so people have some context. Like, the talent in the 80s and 90s in Italy was phenomenal. I mean, Antonio Davis at the Pacers was on this team. Right. There's some other big international names on this Austin team. Austin Georgievich, who yeah. might have been one of the best point guards. You know, no no disrespect to Steve or anybody else. He was in, those cl- in that class with that level of competition. He was not Steve Nash, but he was really good. Right. So what, like when I heard you tell that story, that just uh, shot off a thousand questions in my head. Like what, what were the actual changes? I mean, did it happen overnight? Did you say, wait a second, this just isn't working. We have to blow it up. Was it some of the stuff we've already talked about where you said, maybe if I can get a post player out of the paint, maybe if I can play with a stretch big, maybe if I can open the floor and then empower Sasha and we'll play pick and roll because, you know, Davis could be a great partner for him in pick and roll. What was it exactly that you tweaked and changed on the floor? Well, the biggest thing was, first of all, I had to go through about three weeks of excruciating headaches, being on the couch in a fetal position, getting the hell completely beat out of me by the papers. And this is my team that I played for 13 years I'm in my third year of coaching and I'm ready to get fired. You know, they would, if I was a normal coach, I'd have probably been fired. But because I had all this history with the team and they were reluctant to do it, I went on and I just walked in the the coaches meeting the next day and said, here's what we're doing. And there was some excruciating stuff. Um, I just felt like we, you described it perfectly. Antonio Davis was not being touted as one of the better players over there because of the way I was planning, not because of him. So how can I open him up? Because he was great defensively, great rebounding, but scoring, he couldn't throw it into him, couldn't post up. That's not his game. So that that's one. Two, I had the best point guard in Europe, Sasha Djordjevic, and he was playing awful. Lost his confidence. I lost confidence in him. Uh, a lot of factors there, and I said, okay, there's something wrong there, so I'm playing him wrong because we're throwing the ball in. We had a real, the four player who was leading scorer was what, really good offensively, not very good defensively, but it wasn't working. And so I decided, uh, I might have, you, know, you know, I hate to repeat myself, but put a little guy in, a little slow guy that never missed, period. I mean, one of the best shooters I've ever seen. So I put him in at two, moved my two to three, three to four, took out my four, put him on the bench. He can come in off the bench and give me a little pop. But uh, the team just took off. And it was like, man, from that day, I'm not going back any place close to what I did, although I had to some some teams. But uh, uh, I just opened it up. And it's just all years of playing, all years of thinking, all years of talking basketball, it's just like, man, this is the way to go. So maybe we'll come back to the situations where you kind of had to revert. Um, but in that specific instance in Italy, uh, let me throw the name Bob McAdoo out there. So many <laughs> many listeners know Bob Na- McAdoo, 1975 uh, NBA MVP. But one thing I've talked about a ton in things I've published over the years is how Coach Jack Ramsey did exactly what you talked about. He basically downsized by bumping everyone sure. up the line. He says we're going to uh, put McAdoo at five. McAdoo could put it on the floor, so you give him a little space. He could start on the outside and drive in. You, of course, famously did this with Amari Stoudemire in Phoenix. I think what a lot of people don't realize is you played with Bob McAdoo. Was there an explicit thing in your head that was connecting that, or was it just sort of necessity is the mother of invention, you know, where things aren't working, we have to switch? Well, Bob McAdoo is one of my favorite all-time teammates. We're the best, best of friends. Great, well, Obviously a great player. I don't have to – it's not – I don't have to say it. He was. And he played in this era now where it's really wide open. And they did that. They had Randy Smith who would go and win 1,000 miles an hour. And uh, you put back at, back at the five, he was unstoppable. Now, we played him the times I was with him. He was always playing the four. And so it was kind of – I thought it had been better that if he was exclusively at the five. But we didn't do that. We won anyway because, because he was so good. So it really didn't matter. So I didn't see it with him. I wish that 
I could go back and he was at the five and we could open up for him. He had probably average about 50 points in, in Europe. So, uh, uh, but he's a perfect prototype of the modern player today, the great players of today. Yes. Were you, um, I mentioned earlier that you, you, when you finished your playing career in Italy, you went right to coaching. Were there any old coaches that you ever studied or were influenced by? Um, I mean, maybe not just your own coaches, or did you just kind of go right from the fire to the frying pan? I just went with it. You know, I, I don't, because every situation, and I tell this to a lot of coaches I talk to now, it's hard for me to advise what they should do. Other than, you know, get your own philosophy, what you believe in, because what you believe in is what you're going to teach and and go with it and, and use your own personality. You can't change personalities. Can't be like me. You can't, you know, so it's hard for me to go, well, you should do this, you should do that. Other than some core things that I believe you got to play fast, got to open the floor. And uh, now obviously we're just talking offensive, but defensively keep from scoring. I mean, it's not, you know, rocket science on either way. You want to score more and limit as much as you can, but uh, to critique other coaches or to learn other than, because you everybody has to handle the situation differently, depending on your personality, what 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 bothers you, what what you think bothers the team. All uh, the players are different. Some players can, some teams can take a distraction. Like Chicago Bulls, didn't matter who they put, they can have distracting players because you got the core, but you might have another team that's uh, mentally weak. And you, you know, the distractions hurt. So you've got to figure it out on your own. That's what makes coaching so interesting. And and you're out there on an island, and uh, just got to get them to play the best that they can play, whatever talent you have, or wherever you are, whatever level you're at. Let me let me throw a theory at you, uh, since we've been talking about all this sort of evolution of this stuff. It seems to me that, especially when you go back and watch these old games, the philosophy at the time was let's get players to the highest value spots on the court, meaning under the basket. There was no three-point shot right. for a while, right? right? And then one of the things that has happened over the years, one of the things that I feel like you're alluding to and that you probably influenced um, tremendously in the entire league is actually what if you vacated the highest value spots on the court and then allowed players to move into them, whether with the ball, without the ball, whatever. What do you, what do you think about that sort of shift? Do you buy that? Uh, and is it kind of part and parcel with what you're thinking of when you talk about pace and space. Yeah, I think that definitely is uh, uh, a factor. Uh, but, you know, they, when they put the three-point line out of whether you had it or not, I think I would coach the same way, having people stand out there and moving into where you need to move in to be efficient. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, you do hear stuff that I only want three-point shot, whatever. No, I want the best shot the player can produce that is highly efficient. If you're not highly efficient, you need to change your game ball because you're hurting the team. The more, if you take, if you're shooting 45% effective field goal percentage and you're taking all the shots because you're the superstar, you're hurting the team. You know, so it, it, it can't, it, it's simple math. And so if you are shooting 55%, yeah, let me give the ball more often because then our team goes up. And it's, I don't think it's right. I mean, that's not hard to figure out. But a lot of media, a lot of way we grade players, and you look at them and go, that's, that's not good enough. And, you know, now it's evolving into where, you know, Steph Curry and those guys are off the charts. You know, James Harden when I had him and Steve Nash and, you know, Chris Paul. I hoped Chris Paul, I wanted him to shoot 30 mid-range shots. <laughs> it's fine because his, his mid-range is deadly. So if you have those players, yeah, you get everybody out of the way, let him get to his spot somehow get him there and let him just kill him. So what do you think it is? This is, this has been on my mind for years. Uh, what do you think it is about either coaches? I mean, maybe it's risk aversion or just the nature of the league and how we kind of describe concepts and share ideas and bounce them around that has taken so long. I mean, one for the three point shot to take hold and the things we're talking about, but two, you hit on something else, which I think is, mostly died on the vine, but it was popular when I was growing up. Like if you have a superstar and quote unquote superstar, and he's a big score and he can get his own shot. We're not really going to fuss too much if he's like a 41% shooter. I don't want to, I don't want to mention anyone's name and, and get it. And I won't because I will yeah. still want to live in this country. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. Um, but you know, just conceptually, what do, what do you think 
I mean, you lived through this as a player, a coach, overseas, assistant. What is it that has taken so long for that idea to kind of go away? Well, I think that, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me, to be honest with you. And it should be pretty obvious that that's what, you know, it's pretty obvious. But it's when people uh, have ch- trouble changing, people have trouble uh, looking at it a different way and for it to catch hold and you get everybody to look at it that way. Um, there are biases in there, you know, whether they like players, their own personality wise, how they respond to media, how they conduct themselves. There are biases, but you know, an old NBA thing, you kind of laugh at the adages, like, you know, that player is really great because he can get any shot he wants, and he, but he's really bad because he can get any shot, but he can get any shot he wants. He takes and any so, shot he wants. That's the trade off. Yeah. So that, you know, so I don't know the reason. I mean, it's just human nature, maybe, but uh, there is definitely a, a bias in some of the great players in the league. And I haven't studied it. I don't know. It's just a feeling could be right or wrong or overlooked or so efficient and never get mentioned, you know, as a superstar. But they're so valuable to the team they play on. It's ridiculous. And that team doesn't win without them because they're that efficient. They don't get any credit. They'll never get in the Hall of Fame. It is a team game, and it is like I, you know, I would, I would like that the team goes into the Hall of Fame. It's not the one guy. The one guy you take him off and put Joe, somebody else in there with a high efficiency, probably would go. The team would be really good. And so I, I don't get how we do things a lot of times. And you know what? I was listening to a a radio show time when we had Steve Nash. They were talking about the greatest players in the NBA, and they were discussing you know the panel back back then. And one guy says, well, we haven't mentioned in the top 10 players in the NBA today, Steve Nash. And guess, well, you know, he only makes the team better. It's not like he's that great. <laughs> what? You know, it just, it just blows my mind how people sometimes think and then hype and puff people up and all of a sudden they catch on and they're superstars. Yeah, that, I mean, that's what I'm sort of getting yeah. at with that thought, right? It feels like there's something cultural that's deeply ingrained. And yes. you, you mentioned it, basketball is a team game, but there's this tension between right. it, the individual and the team. One guy doing a lot. Uh, one of my colleagues, he refers to this as basketball is both a team and individual sport because right. of this cultural nature. I mean, maybe maybe it's that. Maybe. I think Golden State is trying to get away from that, you know, because, because of the success they have. You have to have success. You have to win, you know, but... Again, to me, it's like for years, everybody played the exact same way. Well, somebody's going to win. You know? <laughs> so if everybody's playing the same way, you get a good chance, a champion. You say, well, you can only be a champion. You play that way. Well, everybody's playing that yeah. way. And then you have one team maybe playing different. Well, that team doesn't win. Well, the other had 29 chances. You had one. You don't win. They say, well, you can't win that way. Well, that doesn't make any sense. If 28 teams played the way that one played and there's one that played the old way, that one probably would not win. So it's, 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 it's just mind blowing. Um, I promise that this is not a direct segue from the last question. If anyone out there is going to point fingers at the player, I'm, I'm going to allude to here, but uh, we don't even have to mention his name, but the, everyone asks about the 2005 sons. And, and we can of course talk about that, but I've always been fascinated by the 2004 sons, which is a different construction. You, you're swapping out, Essentially, Marbury for Nash and a few other things are changing. Um, But a couple things happening there. One, everything we've talked about so far in terms of changing rosters. I believe you spent a lot of time with two traditional bigs. I haven't gone back and done X's and O's deep dive. I apologize. This is the full year I was the coach? This In 2004, that was the partial year. And then 2005 was the first full year. Right, 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 right. Yeah, so, so I you're think talking it, about 2004. 2004. I think yeah. 2004, the 0304 season, you had more right. double big lineups, not right. necessarily the stuff we were talking about earlier with Amari at five. Um, and then, you know, were the X's and O's different? Was Oh, another thing there is that's the only time in your career you don't get that magic 10-shot 10, 10 jump in three-point right. shot attempts because you didn't, you know, in theory, you didn't have the offseason. So maybe speak to that a little bit about... 2004 versus 2005 and the 
all of the philosophical things we've talked about that maybe you weren't able to, why weren't you able to apply them? What were the big changes? Um, and then, you know, from that year to, to 05. Well, you know, again, a lot of things, you know, went into it, like, because it took over halfway through the year. So there's no training camp. There's no way to, you know, just break everything down and talk, trying to develop Joe Johnson, played a lot of point guard uh, with that group. Um, Can I jump in on the training? So, you take over, there's no training camp. So essentially, do you feel like you're running someone else's offense at that point? Or do you still try to Im sort of implement the principles we've discussed? I didn't want to go too quickly on just throwing everything out the window. I remember the first game, and we we're just trying to develop players and look at them and get a good feel. And I remember having a conversation with Brian Clangelo, the general manager. And he said, you know, the biggest thing is just try to be a positive increase, especially the last 10 to 12 games, that we can go into next year with a little bit of momentum in what you're doing. And so it was slow. Wanted to make sure the players were okay. Anytime there were enough people. And I remember the first game, I take over without any kind of practice or whatever. And I was afraid we were going to set the NBA record for low number of points. I'm like dying over there. And here we go again, you know, a little bit like the Denver thing. It's just, you know, if I didn't stick now, I was done. And so I just was real cautious and real traditional on what I was doing and being, you know, I didn't want to go against the grain that early. Right. And so I had to get my confidence up a little bit, to be honest with you, and make sure management and everybody was on board. And and we just, you know, the transition next year just got lucky. We got Steve Nash, and all of a sudden, now we can talk about different ways to play because he was the engine that made you play. And I think the, the, you know, I was getting Joe Johnson, who's a great, great player, one of the better players in the NBA. And he, uh, getting him comfortable and developing him as a point guard and as a two guard. So he played both. And just great things, positive things came out of it that we were able to build on the next year. But I didn't implement anything until the next year. And then even then, if I remember correctly, it wasn't the first two or three games. It took – about five games to get Amari completed at the five and get it together. I was still a little nervous about going in because what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about that? And, you know, and you have other people that, you know, on your staff or just now all in good faith don't believe in, you know, Amari's not going to be able to play the five. Right. So it took a while to, to you know, get some toughness and do what I thought was right. So, 2004 offseason heading into that 2004-2005 season where Nash wins MVP. Did you see stuff? Did Were there discussions with management? Did you say the skills that this guy showed in Dallas will, in your mind, like fit perfectly with what I want to do? Or was it what you alluded to earlier where, you know, you, you walk in the gym, those are the groceries, and you figure out what meal to make once you once you have the ingredients? Well, you know, it's funny because Steve Nash lived in Phoenix, uh, in the offseason, or, or he came by there. I don't know. He spent some time in Phoenix. I do know that when he was with Dallas. And in September, the guys would get together and just play. And so I'd be up there just watching them just play, and Steve would be on one team. And that team was just – it was like bam, 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 the ball was going all over the place. And, and you could feel, man, that's good. And so when the time came for a free agent, uh, sure. I mean, that guy would be plug him in and we can we can really open things up. And he's just the point guard you're looking for. And there because there was some serious doubts. And the only reason we got him is because uh, Dallas didn't offer him a contract, did not sign him back. And so otherwise he wouldn't have come. He was happy in Dallas and Dirk and him had that uh, relationship. No way we would have got him, but they didn't offer him a contract. And so we were able to step in and get him and, you know, obviously it changed my whole life, changed a lot of people's lives. And he was so good for the community and uh, and the team. But going that summer, and one thing I like to do as a coach is I'm with the general manager all the time. And I like getting in the office early, general manager being there, and we just talk basketball. And I did that with Brian. I was lucky. And then also uh, Jerry Colangelo, who owned the team at the time. And we just sat and talked. And I remember distinctly sometime halfway through the summer after we got Nash, got the team, they were working out a little bit. 
And he's going, how, you know, how are you going to play him? And, you know, I'm almost, you know, I don't know. and um, he says, well, you know, who are your best five best players? And I told him. And he goes, well, play him. I go, seriously? <laughs> I mean, he goes, yeah, I think. Because they were, you know, back in the day with Rex, Rex Chapman and those guys, Danny Ainge, yep. they played small ball. They had uh, Kidd and Kevin Johnson. Right. And I'm not sure if they'd ever roll all three out because Nash was a, a I rookie. I think a little bit, but probably just to look at it yeah. as a freak show, but they probably should have. Yeah. Then it wasn't. But I always believe, too, and I, I had this coming from Europe, the more more point guards you have on the team, the better your team's going to be. Whether that's a point center, you know, there's a lot of guys that are point guards. Anytime you have the ball in your hand, you're the point guard. And so if that ball moves around, you have you have. If you're not shooting it, if you're going to make a play, you're the point guard. And so all the, if you have five guys that can do that, I mean, just think how good your team. And that's why our Golden State's so good. They have a lot of guys that can make plays, and you can spread it out. So when he gave me that encouragement, a new management is with me. We have the players. Why wouldn't we do it? And it took a little bit, uh, even in training camp, to uh, get over the hump and get to exactly that. And then it all kind of fell out in our hand that that was the best way to play them. Is is there, I mean, there's discomfort because you're trying something new and, you know, if, right. it, if it goes wrong, but is there explicit discomfort about what you give up on defense? And of course, the criticisms over the years right. of, I mean, you, you guys and your teams that you've coached have had some monster point differentials, 60 plus wins right. from, from in my in my world, championship level teams. Um, you know, right there with the best teams. But right. when you're easing into this in, in day one, is part of the apprehension like, man, what's it going to look like or feel like if we give up a 35-point quarter or something right. like that? Right. Oh, without a doubt. And a lot of times uh, that goes from the history of the league. You're only graded on how good your defense is. And it's like, well, you do we want to lose 80, 70, you know, 80 to 70 or – 110 to 100, <laughs> what's the difference? You know, so, you know, we spent, a, you know, don't, I don't mind the criticism that our defense should be, could have been better. Probably if you have the best offense, it's probably the reason you don't win a championship. It's because of defense, okay? You know, I get it to a certain extent, although I do think winning championships comes down to hitting big shots and big moments, getting some calls, be sure you don't get injured. There's a lot of factors that go into winning a championship that, Things just have to kind of click. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I I don't like that we didn't spend any time on it, that we didn't talk about it, that we didn't. And that, that's all BS, you know, because that's all we thought about. We knew the offense was good. So why? I mean, well, we, we're not that dumb. So like we're sitting there, you know, how can we get our defense as good as our offense? And you do give up stuff. But we, we always went, and I forget, one of my assistant coaches said that we're not going to out Shaq Shaq. So, if it, you know, Shaq was at an L.A. right in that period before he got traded to Miami. And that summer, we kind of made the team to where to get out of our little division or conference, we got to beat the Lakers. They got Shaq. Well, I can trot out any center that you want to talk to in that area that we could get. He was going to destroy them. So let's put Amari there. Okay, he's going to score. He's going to score anyway. But now he's at least got a guard on the other end. And can we make up by point? Let's say he's worth our, our, our point. Our, our center we get out there gets us five points. He gets thirty-five, or he gets forty, and then Amari gets thirty. You know, it's like okay. So it's uh, uh, we looked at the difference of points and what it can produce, and how can we beat them? We did it with Golden State. How can we beat Golden State? How, you know, we wanted to win a championship. Second place, fourth place, fifth place, second place. You know, it's like. Doesn't matter, does it? If you don't win a championship, and you know, we knew regular season we'd be good, but can we beat these guys when it comes down to it? And a lot of the philosophy went into that. And how do you develop a team to beat uh, the best team in the league? What's amazing to me is you're essentially describing zigging when everyone else is zagging. You're you, you mentioned it earlier, like all thirty teams playing the same way, and just well, there's a really big boulder. So let's also bring a rock instead yeah. of some other, right? Instead of some other, some other tool. Um, 
And I've tried to keep track of maybe one day I'll do a video on just like all the small ball lineups. But just as a Shaq example that jumps out to me, in the 2001 finals, Larry Brown for like five or eight minutes has this incredible lineup where he has Rajah Bell playing power forward with three <laughs> guards and just, you know, whatever, I mean, Ty Hill, I don't remember who the, the big was, but right. all the broadcast, you know, everyone calling the game is like, this is crazy. They have no big men out there right. against Shaq. And you don't really have to squint to see that the quickness actually does something. There's a trade-off right. between right. having all these small guys on the court. I actually think they might've won those seven or eight minutes uh, well, and the thing has been, it's like when you do that, right, and it goes bad and you lose, we were going to get beat anyway. You know, it's like, so you try something different, but you're, you're an idiot because you tried it. Well, you weren't going to win right. the other way. What is the big idiot? Not yeah. trying something different? We're just doing the same thing over and over and just keep <laughs> feel. It doesn't make, it didn't make any, and I'm sure it doesn't make sense to anybody, actually, if they think about it. But because it's so easy to, you know, throw out adages or, you know, I love basketball adages because mostly the ones that came out of the video are all wrong. You know, anytime you're looking at adages, it's like, well, I'll find four other examples where that doesn't even make sense what you're talking about. But, uh, but you're right. It's, uh, there's, we used to play, I, I was in Italy a lot of times, a team would throw a crazy zone against us. And, and so they would be even, we were like the best team in Europe. And they'd be even with us with three minutes to go in the game and be a tie score. Then they change up and go to man, and we win. It's like, did they, did they want to just blow us out? Is that what they're, they're doing? No, get close, hit big shots, and you might have won. Otherwise, you're not going to win because we were better than you. So it's 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 crazy to me. Yeah, no, I think the big idiot would be uh, my my nickname that Shaq would give me uh, if I were involved in this. Um, so okay. The um, we're talking about small ball. You were talking about point guards. I love that point you made about everyone's a point guard. You've got this. There's this old book. It's like 15 years old. I think it's called the NBA Coaches Playbook. And you and your staff had a blurb in it. And the the blurb that literally jumped out to me that I pulled for our discussion today was about empowering ball handlers and having the more ball handlers you can have on the court at once, uh, the better it is. And, and we have a running gag on this show. It's like Boris Diaw appreciation hour. I mean, is that the kind of player where you can play some, you know, you can play him at four or five or whatever it is, but he also has these skills as a ball handler, decision maker, passer that sort of opens up or synergizes with all this stuff that we've talked about pace, space, um, empty lane, you know, all, all of it. You know, it's funny when you mentioned Boris Dow, who is one of the great players in the NBA. And the people, whatever they want to say about Boris, they will pick out something and obscure. But when you come down to the knowledge of the game, how he saw the game, he's as good as anybody that ever played the game. Now, did he, was he a, you know, a little bit soft or whatever? Maybe, but I, I thought he was just skills. I didn't think it was soft. You know, they used to boo him sometimes in Phoenix because it looked like he had a layup or he could dunk it, but he would pass it out to a three-point shooter and they would, I would hear him, you know, oh, yeah, that, that, that. And it's like, but if you go back and look at the film, he could see here comes one of their big guys and that layup would have probably been blocked or would have been hard to do. And he just threw it out for an easy three-point shot. Now, whether you make it or miss it, that's, you know, obviously whatever. But his knowledge of the game is second to none and great guy to coach. And when we got him, his reputation was not good. You know, it was like, oh, he's soft. He's this, he's that. And it, after about 10 practices, we're going, <laughs> it's the most competitive, smartest player we've ever coached. And he just fit in perfect for what we're doing. And, you know, Boris does have a habit that, that if there was no hope, He's not doing it. You know, it's like the team not playing the way they should play. Then he gets kind of, uh, but when he went to San Antonio, he was great. When he was with ball moving, free moving, you know, understand basketball, he's a good, he's a really good player. So I, I, I want to get to Houston before we get out of here. But the last thing that was really on my list here to hit in Phoenix, uh, you've mentioned it, is there is this idea 
that I think you've said it. I've heard, I've heard many, many people said it. Um, Steve Nash should have taken more threes. I think, I think you've said stuff like we didn't, we didn't lean into these ideas right. we're talking about enough. Um, my hot take, Mike, is that Nash was actually closer to an optimal balance for the entire offense's efficiency because, yeah. precisely because, he was so gifted as a passer and a decision maker. The kind of things that we're alluding to that unlock right. the system, right? Because right. originally, if you don't watch Steve Nash for 15 years, you go back and watch Phoenix, you might say, there are definitely times where you say, why didn't he shoot that three? Right. Um, you know, someone goes under the pick and roll, and back then it wasn't an automatic pull from three. Right. Nash is one of the greatest shooters ever. So it's understandable where that idea comes from. But then you watch the rest of the play, you guys still got a layup. It, right. was, it was just a layup line. So I, I wanted to throw that out there because uh, I've heard you say that before. You know, maybe what, what do you have in mind specifically when you think he should have shot more threes or he, sh- he should have leaned into it? And then do you kind of buy the idea? Like your offensive ratings and efficiencies in Phoenix are basically – just about the best the league has ever seen relative to the competition. So my, my hot take is that it was working pretty darn well. Well, and, and you know, it's funny, right? Because first of all, you know, as you get older and even, even younger, it doesn't matter what it, you say crap, it don't mean crap. You know, it's like, it's cute. Oh, my, it's fun. You know, we were really good offensively. So that wasn't our problem. And if we, we should have won or didn't win or, or, you know, be honest with you, you know, San Antonio was really, really freaking good. And they, I always thought that their gamesmanship, how they played the game, when to take a charge, when not, when to flop, when not to flop, when to, you know, how how they just kind of fool us sometimes. When to know? do something at the end of the game to possibly yeah, get just, under you know, someone's just skin. A little bit here and there that they knew they had to, whatever it was, destiny, I don't know what it is, uh, but they had it and they deserved it and they're, they're great. But, um, um, Steve, the only thing maybe, you know, if you want to revise what I said, and I agree with you that it was good, I think we could have squeezed another point or two out of it to make it even a little bit better. And I think we were running pretty max on it. You know, we had some great players, great shooters. Uh, you know, Sean Marion's one of the best players that play in the NBA. Probably if, if he – I don't know what he shot from three, maybe for 30, 31. Wasn't a great shooter. If he could have shot 40%, then yeah, okay, now our team has the same number of shots. We're doing better. Uh, you know, Joe Johnson back then, the uh, year we had him the first year, she was 47% three. Yeah. I mean, I, I looked at that stat the other day and I was unbelievable. I mean, that, that right there, and I didn't even know it back then. You know, it didn't take a lot, but he shot 47%. So we could have maybe exploited that one a little bit more. Uh, there was different things that we could have done. But you're right, Steve and per se the way he ran the team is almost perfection. He, I remember talking to my coaches and we went through that second year with him, the second MVP that he had. And I bet there wasn't, he'd come down a fast break, he's handling the ball all the time and he's making all that. He didn't make 10 bad decisions probably the whole year. And that's, a, you know, he has about 80 a game that he has to figure out. And he's, he's right on, whether it's a good pass or not, it was the right pass to do. And he, he was incredible. And anybody that doubts the two MVPs are crazy. Uh, he was as good or better. You know, you always have three guys in the discussion, and he, each guy deserves it. But he was deserving as much as anybody, if not more. And uh, that's, that's not even, with me, it's not even a discussion to have. Was he doing stuff in practice that even – like, was it experimentation and eclipsed what we saw in the game, or was it just the same no matter where he played? It's the same no matter where. He was just good. He, he was just – you couldn't stay in front of him. He's slow. He's not overly fast or athletic. Couldn't stay in front of him. He just knew the angles, and he was such a good shooter. I think sometimes shooting is such a big premium in this league and being able to hit big shots at big moments – are such that's why Robert Orr has seven rings. He hits big shots for whatever whatever that makes it. At the time when it comes in, he can hit that shot. And there's a lot of guys probably had as many shots as he's had to hit them. He hit all of them. <laughs> and another guy might hit one, and he's all he's great. Well, he hit all seven of them to win rings. And he, uh, he there's just different players have something in them that brings them out. I don't know what it is. 
Let's uh, let's finish up with some Houston stuff because it was a fascinating evolution for me to watch. Where you come out of Phoenix, um, obviously New York, and you know other other sort of players come through your uh, coaching experience, and then Houston. Houston, it feels to me. You tell me if I'm wrong. Like all the principles we've talked about, you brought to Houston in 2017. But at some point there, maybe it's getting more familiar with James Harden. Maybe it's the other personnel around him. Maybe it's the shape of the league. I don't know. At some point, maybe it's the data. 2018, 2019, it feels like you guys realize, actually, if we just create the space and isolate for him as a scorer, that is now the optimal path. It's not necessary. He doesn't need to bring a defender up on the screen or something like that. Um, am I on track here? Talk, talk me through this sort of last stage of evolution where with Harden, all the same principles we've talked about apply, but you end up with this thing that is more stationary with the other players ultimately on a lot of possessions. Yeah. And then he's just sort of isolating into all that space that you create with the shooters. Well, what happened, I think, and you know, I'd have to go back and watch all the games and make sure, but in my, my feeling is that the defense dictated us to do that more. We were so efficient at the pick and roll, either with Capella rolling or whoever the five was, um, PJ sometimes, even the one, two, whatever. And we'd always get the weakest defender on him because they had to switch. If they didn't switch, we would have gone into a lot less one-on-one. -on -one. You know, he never came down and went really one-on-one -on, -one on his, you know, I'm, I say never, should never say never, but he most of the time he would never go on against their better defender that's on him. So he'd get a matchup that he is either going to get a good shot or he can get into the lane, collapse it, and then we're going to get a shot. So it turned into a one-on-one -on -one game, but there was a reason for it because the defense couldn't guard us the other way. And so, especially, you know, everybody starts off guarding the right way, and he's just torture, you know, lobs to Capella, throwing out to our three-point shooters. And uh, and that year we had Chris Paul also, and the same thing with Chris. Uh, Chris, when he came in with James on the bench, our second team was really good. If you look at that year, that second team with Chris running it, you, usually if we're up three, we're up eight. If we're down two, we're up five. You know, it's like – that second group either uh, lengthened it or whatever. And Chris was just a maestro at running our offense and doing it a little bit Nash-like. And Harden had to do it like Harden did it. But both of them are good. Both of them are perfect on what they're doing. And so I just think it's a combination of the way the defense, that's what they gave us. That was the best thing. And we tracked that. If that one-on-one -on -one was not efficient, we wouldn't do it. But it was doing, if I'm not mistaken, 1.2 something ridiculous – all, and just for everybody's viewers, like 1.16 a long time was the standard of the best offense an NBA team had. And Gold State, and we, we kind of blew that out of, out of the water a little bit, 1 to 120, 1 1.20. But our isolation game was like 1.25 and 1.24. So it's like, why wouldn't we isolate? I mean, people don't like it. Aesthetically, it's not good. I don't love it. I like rather pass the ball around. If I had a team that didn't have James Harden, guess what? We'd be passing the ball around. You got James Harden, you go, I'm gonna make James Harden the best player he can possibly be. It's in my mind. And it has to coincide with winning. We were winning 60 games a year. So it's like now we gotta get over the hump. We gotta win a championship. And I thought we had it the third year with until Chris went down. Maybe not, you know, who knows? Because Golden State had hearts of champions and those guys are hard to beat. But I thought we had a good chance at him, that's for sure. So I think I know the answer to this now, but I mean, if you guys switch rosters in that series or either series, you played them in 18 and 19, it sounds like the offensive approach, it might still come from the same principles we talked about, but I think uh, there's an impression that at that point in time, it's like if you switch teams, then Curry would just be the one isolating versus Harden, but it's more that the system formed around him. And I loved what you said about the defense responding, because that's a great point. Teams are switching as a defense mechanism to stop yeah. the, to stop the pick and roll. Yeah. They wouldn't switch if they could stop the other stuff. They couldn't yeah. stop the other stuff. So they, they put us and we did the same thing against Golden State. We knew that all their ball movement 
coming off screens, if we guard them traditionally, they will kill us or they would, you know, that. But so if we could switch everybody and get out there and be aggressive, they went one on one all the time. And that's why Steve Kerr was upset because there wasn't the 300 passes or whatever they their, their standard was. Right. Well, they, they didn't they could pass all they want. To. I don't care. Because it wasn't penetrating our defense. We could stay in front of, we had the team, and we could switch everything and make them. Now, they just happen to have the best one-on-one player in the world, Kevin, Kevin Durant. That's not good, but there's not, But if we guard him the other way, they were going to kill us. So at least we had a chance this way to slow them down. And we hoped our offense would be good enough that we could beat them. Yeah, I, I had the stat at some point. I think with... Paul on the court and Harden on the bench. I I, know it's more second units, right? But I think to your point, I think the net differential in points you guys had was actually a little bit better than when it was Harden on the court. I think both of those guys just being able to do that was so powerful. I mean, essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you can kind of take the same system, one's on the bench, and you can still say all the exact same principles apply because in both cases I have an all time level, you know, operator of uh, on ball point guard, let's say decision maker, uh, s- score, whatever. Yeah, for sure. We, we, we looked at that and just, we didn't have to change anything. Most teams you don't, and I'm not going to change spreading the floor, pick and roll, getting a big guy, put pressure on the rim, try to go in and out, but I'm not, you know, Golden State uses, they post up to go out. They don't score from the post up. They just dribble up people and come off, pick, you know, uh, screens and stuff. Uh, so they have their system. We had it a different way. We we actually had Harden, who was incredible about the strength and the ability to be able to see and having. He really liked, and he would tell me all the time, put that guy there, this guy there, that guy there, and I'll get us two points or three. So, yeah, that's what we did. And, then, you know, again, it wasn't pretty. People can complain. But you, when you have the most efficient offense in NBA history or close to it, then why wouldn't you do it? Just because we want to look pretty? You know, and they got all the purists. Well, they don't pass the ball, move. And, you know, I know it's not pretty. But, who, you know, it's like, come on, guys, figure it out. <laughs> so when he said put someone here, put someone – was it the same? Was he always like guy in the dunker spot? Or well, did it well, did it change? Not right? a whole lot. Not a, you know, it – he would only do that against the really good teams that were that he'd be in the playoffs or, you know, I remember, uh, you know, that he, he, James is one of the smartest players and there's a bunch of them, but he's one of them that I've ever coached. And he knew what was happening all, all over the floor. Now he might not do it all the time because he didn't want to, but he knew if he messed up on defense, he knew it's not like he didn't know. It's like, yeah, okay, coach, you got me. I just didn't really want to go over there and do that. But he's smart and he knows how to how to manipulate the game. And I thought probably in two or three years there that he can had a complete mastery of the game. He went over fifty, I don't know how many times in a row. And we were banged up one night. And I said, James, you might have to get fifty tonight for us to even have a chance to win. He gets 60, you know, and we win, you know, just stuff like that. He just could, could, he was able to just, uh, and just a master of the game. You mentioned the defense. Um, you guys switched a lot. It seemed to me that Harden almost kind of, I mean, he was big and strong, but yeah. you almost wanted to keep him lower on the floor. Uh, I mean, was that a, conscious thing is that am i am i way off base did was he just another cog in the wheel or whatever or like what do you mean of, lower on the floor what, well um, well if you're he's almost he's almost playing like a big i feel like when you start getting later in the in the houston periods where wow. um instead of him coming out 35 feet away involved in a pick and roll you keep him you know closer to the basket essentially yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes we go back and forth. I just think it's more of a feel. You know, we like we like the low pick and roll down toward the baseline or at the elbows or, you know, we like that. Uh, but a lot of it is the other team dictates a lot of who you're playing, what's going on. So we, I didn't leave. 
you know, it's not like I studied so much that one thing. We just, it's more of a philosophy, how you plan, is it fast enough? Are we going, are we getting the guys in the right spot? Are they respecting the the, the spacing? And so we, we just spent a lot of time looking at that. At the end of uh, your time in Houston, you finally did lean in more. You guys got even smaller uh, at the, at the well, very end. But there's a reason for that. Go ahead. Well, I, I dubbed this I dubbed this micro ball, um, and I'm sure you can uh, provide a number of insights on the offensive side. But the thing that always fascinated me was the defensive side. Like you know Robert Covington playing center or something like that. Like uh, talk about that sort of last final, how small can we really go period in Houston? Well, you know, it's funny because we used to use I mean, a lot of times a player might balk, like, I don't want to play center. I go fine. You're the three, but you're playing <laughs> like, three. you know, it's like you call yourself anything you want to call yourself. You know, you're guarding that guy and you're playing right there. So you're not the center though. You're my, you know, whatever. Um, we had to go small. And, I, you know, I love, you know, Clint Capel's a great player. And I like what he brings. You know, there was a couple of things that, that uh, you know, he couldn't quite make foul shots at the end of games. He wasn't a great foul shooter. So that hurts you, especially when you get to a one possession or two possession game. The other coach is thinking, okay, now we can foul or we can risk, you know, him going to the foul line. So that that's what, one reasoning behind us. Another reasoning is, you know, how can we – make Russell Westbrook the most effective possible. And that was to open the floor up and get him to the rim because there's not many better than him getting to the rim and his athleticism. How can we use that? And that's where it came from. It, uh, and Daryl went all in and and we thought to be able to have a chance to win a championship again. It's just talking about championships. It's not talking about anything else. That would give us the best chance to be able to win. And it went really well when, you know, went to, you know, in the bubble. We had the Lakers. We beat them the first game because they insisted on playing a big guy, and we beat them. And second game, Anthony Davis goes over to the five, and now, oh, they're small. And then I hate – I don't even like to use the word small lineup. They're talented lineup because they put guys that are talented because they're all big. I mean, it's not like, you know, it might be small to today's standards a little bit, but, you know, if you're six seven, or if you're 6'10", Okay, your arms might be longer. You know, people just look at, they don't do any, you know, P.J. Tucker can guard anybody in the world. doesn't matter who he is. Big, little, he'll use his strength. So he's not really small. He's big. Robert Covington is one of the best post defenders that we have. James is one of the best post defenders. I think he even led the league in defending the post better than anybody. So what is just because there's little, you know, so where you can't guard the post. Well, we had the best defender in the league in James Harden and the post. And PJ is, is one of the best defenders in the league. So it's then that stuff didn't make any sense. But um, it all it just evolved on getting Russell. And I thought Russell, until he got hurt, or he hurt his squad and got, you know, COVID, you know, knocked him for a loop a little bit. And so he missed a lot of coming back in the bubble, and it wasn't quite what he was for January, February, and March until we got shut down. I thought we had a real good shot at at knocking off the Lakers or or winning the championship. Yeah, the uh, the option to just go with Anthony Davis and LeBron James on your back line and say you're you're small. <laughs> yeah, right, right. You know, Ron, yeah. Ron is what, 6'9", 270, the fastest guy on the floor. Yeah, he's really small. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that that turned out to be a, a cheat code, I thought, for them for all of their playoff series, basically. Without a doubt, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, la- last bonus question, Mike, before we wrap up. You, you've coached all these great players. Um, I'm I'm gonna try to put you on the spot. I'm thinking of which okay. ones. Let let's do uh, Steve Nash and Chris Paul. In whatever way you want, compare and contrast the differences with coaching them and sort of what they brought to the game. As we've talked about your philosophy for the last hour. Well, very similar. Uh, I won sixty two with Steve. I won sixty five with Chris. So I guess he gets a nod there. Um but Chris had James for that one. Well there, there you go. Well and and Steve had Amari or uh 
And, you know, we, we had a really good team. So both teams are great. And also, you know, it's funny because sometimes things fall in. You know, you go, I don't know, you got the Lakers, you go in the Lakers, which is normally would be a loss or something, but they're good. Well, they got two players out, so you win that game. So you go. So at the end of the year, some years you have, everybody was hurt every place we went, we're going to lose. So now you win 65. So, or, you know, you're good, but that little difference that you can't really read into it. But anyway, so Chris, uh, both of them incredible shooters. Steve, probably a better three point shooter than Chris. Um, Mid range, probably the same. I don't know who has the better stats, but you're talking ungodly numbers, foul shooting. And Steve was a quiet leader, didn't say a whole lot of anything, led by just doing it. Where Chris likes, he's vocal in his leadership. And so just different players, but it's really, really hard to say this guy was better than that guy. Both of them can see the floor. I don't know. You know, I, I I really don't. I'm not just copying out, and I don't know how we can compare players at you know different times. Or you know, Chris Paul has been one of the best point guards in the league for the last 15 years, without a doubt. Uh, Steve Nash was one of the best point guards for sure. So, I, I no, I think they're I think they're two uh, the best ever, and I think I know one thing. Either guy on your team, you'd be a hell of a coach. You, you have, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you just that. if you just give me a few more of those guys, I, I could. Got uh, today. That you can't. It's hard to mess those guys up. Yeah, you know, yeah. there are certain teams that coaches can mess up, and you don't get the full stuff out of them. But guys like that, it's hard to mess up. Mike, this was uh, this was incredibly fun. Uh, thanks so much for, for sure, doing it. Yeah. Learned a ton. To well, I don't and, know about learning a ton. Like I said, I, well, I, I, I have. <laughs> well, I have a hard time, you know, looking at other coaches and saying whether they're good or not. I don't know. I'd, I'd have to be at the practice. I'd have to be how they talk to guys one on one. There's just so much that goes into it. You can't just judge somebody by, how, you know, what, unless they're playing completely screwy, you know, then you can kind of tell. But who knows? It's a weird pos- pos- uh, profession, fun. And that's why there will be guys like you and why the league keeps getting better because you can discuss it and you'll never find the answer. It just keeps on going. It's, 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 uh, wow. You've, you've really described the state of my, uh, my entity that I have here in a very, very nihilistic wow. way. <laughs> no, it's fun though. I mean, that's why I appreciate you guys because you get me paid, you know, and you know, hope you, hopefully you get paid yourself. So, Hopefully it's part of the business and uh, basketball is a great business. Yeah, it's um, it's a lot of fun. And um, mm-hmm. I completely agree with what your last point was there about how hard it is to judge coaches. I actually think based on this conversation now, I, I need to be more lenient about the screwiest kind of left field coaching decisions because maybe that's we maybe we need more of that experimentation well because to, you, the problem has been you don't know what went into that decision exactly yeah you know yeah. some people will say why don't you do this and my thing was you don't think we didn't discuss that you think that i've got five guys great coaches on my staff with a, with all the stats and analytics and everything Oh, that just slipped my mind. I didn't know that we were supposed to talk about that. Sure, we talked about it. There's a reason why we threw it out. Now, it might be the wrong decision, but I don't know if that decision would have worked any better than what we did. Right. That's the nature That's the nature of yeah, the money, game. Money yeah. quarterbacks, you, you're never wrong. You, never, yeah. you don't, can't prove it. But that's why it's fun. And that's why, you know, I, I never took it, you know, the criticism and all that, took it to heart because – I would probably I'm probably doing the same thing talking to my buddies about what did I do that, but I don't know when it comes down to it. If you want to support this podcast, check out patreon.com slash thinking basketball. We have a ton more content. We have a monthly Q and A. We have a community Discord, historical stats. I I can't remember all the stuff we have over there. Patreon.com slash thinking basketball is the best way to directly support this show. Otherwise, thanks a ton to Coach Mike D'Antoni. Thank t- thanks to you for listening all the way until the end. I hope you enjoyed it. And as always, I hope that you are having a great day. Thanks, man.